But frankly, I don't think you've got a snowball's chance in hell of coming back alive. We had no orders. We had no weapons. We had nothing. Uh, The problem with the team was solved. He said, what did you do? I said, you don't want to know. It's sounding a bit like uh, the beginning of Apocalypse Now. I could summon up uh, a hot heat. No one ever survived the question of suspect. Alan, how are you, brother? I'm doing well today, Chris. It's beautiful weather here in Florida. Yes. What kind of uh, season is it there at the moment? Right now, uh, we are in what we would call the uh, tourist season. Uh, the, the resorts are all fairly well crowded. Unfortunately, any tourists coming down here right now are going to uh, be dealing with the, uh, uh, the cool weather we're having. I mean, it's awful. It's only in the mid-60s. And so uh, all those people coming from up north are having to put up with all of us down here wearing our down jackets and our gloves. Meanwhile, somebody from up in Canada is in shorts. You can tell the people from Canada because they're the one the sun really glistens off of. The rest of us have sort of a permanent light tan, let's say. Yes. I'm, well, I was saying to you earlier, I learned to fly and skydive in Florida. And uh, when I was there, my gosh, it was so hot. That sun doesn't half beat down. Uh, yes, that's, that happens during the warm summer months when it gets up to 115 or so. Uh, that's when I go out and play golf at noon because no one else is on the golf course. <laughs> and having spent uh, uh, time in Southeast Asia... Uh, I really do have, the heat has never bothered me since I spent uh, a tour of duty in Vietnam, where it was really hot on occasion, up in the 120s. Miserable for heat, without air conditioning, mind you. Yeah, and I'm guessing no one's, uh, well, hopefully not too many people shooting at you on the, on the golf course. No, uh, I will say that no one has ever shot to me on the golf course. I have to admit, I have had my share of being shot at in uh, Vietnam. And I actually, I have never returned to Vietnam, but it's on my bucket list. Because just once in my life, just once, I would like to drive north out of Da Nang and go over that Haivon Pass, the Haivon Pass, which has a bunch of switchbacks to go up the mountainside. And just once, I would like to go over the Haivon Pass without someone shooting at me. Yes. And I want to see if at the the top of the Haivon Pass, that little bar is still there, the one where we used to stop to get a beer or two if we survived getting up. Incredible. (laughs) I was in Vietnam, uh, gosh, probably about 15 years ago now. And... um, I made a schoolboy error in thinking it was going to be hot there. Mm -hmm. As such, I just had a small day pack with me. I I think I was wearing shorts and a a T-shirt. And when you get up there in those mountains, it really does get cold. Yes, it does. It it can get very cold at night uh, and damp, damp cold, or it'll go right through you. Uh, But... uh, I, having grown up in uh, New England, up in Massachusetts, I was used to damp cold, so that didn't bother me. Uh, I got used to the heat fairly quickly. Uh, I'm lucky I can adjust like that, so that didn't bother me. Uh, it was a interesting period of uh, time to be in Vietnam. Uh, I was there exactly 50 years ago uh, right now uh, doing, during my tour of duty. And I have to say that... Uh, this was one of those unexpected things in life because uh, this was 19 uh, would have been 1972 when I was in country. And this was at the end of the active phase of the, of the war, which had been going on really since 65. And uh, I had managed to avoid the war and uh, really had thought I had gotten off uh, fairly free. Uh, 
going to through uh, university at Syracuse, I had uh, had a student deferment. And then coming out, uh, when I graduated in 68, my draft board was anxious to meet me in person and uh, have me go for a physical, uh, but I wanted to go and do a master's degree in uh, library and information sciences. And I was en enrolled in a college in Boston, Simmons College, for young women, but that's another story altogether. Uh, the, uh, 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 so I went to my draft board and they said, well, we're going to send you for a physical. And I thought to myself, well, if they're sending me for a physical, that means they're going to want to draft me as soon as, as, soon as they can. I had the advantage over the, uh, my local draft board. I knew the selective service law and they didn't because at Syracuse, I'd worked for the Dean of Men and one of my duties had been an advisor to the freshman men on the selective service law. And I knew they could not draft me out of a semester in which I was currently enrolled. So I went to the registrar at Simmons and enrolled for the fall semester, the January semester, the spring semester, the following summer semester. That's as much as they'd let me do. And when my draft board called me, uh, I said, well, you can't do anything right now because I'm enrolled in school. And they said, well, when do you, and I explained what I had done to them and they were upset with me. Uh, so as soon as they could, they began to send me for physicals, which I failed. I was born with a heart condition. Until one day I went for a physical, I think it was the fourth one they sent me into Boston for. And the doctor was a real old fart. You know, he was in his mid thirties or something like that. And he must have had a head cold and he didn't hear my heart condition, my heart murmur, even after I told him. And uh, I passed that section. They literally pulled me out of line, told me I could get dressed because I was going to be 1A, eligible to be drafted right away. I actually needed four more months to finish my master's degree. So I had prepared ahead of time. And uh, the Navy recruiter was a member of the church when my father was the pastor. I grew up in a minister's family. And so I went to see about this friendly Navy recruiter and I said, here's my problem. I need four more months to finish my master's degree. And he said, no trouble. You can enlist uh, under a four month delay and finish your master's degree. And that's what I did. Uh, I had not planned to go into the Navy, but I had figured, I figured, actually figured two, four years in the Navy was better than two years in the army. Uh, because going into the army meant a ticket to Southeast Asia. And I really didn't want to do that. So I enlisted for four years in the Navy, figuring that I could uh, study journalism or something like that. They would give me my choice of duty. But that's what the recruiter said to me. I'm still looking for that recruiter. And if I find him, I'm going to figuratively beat the shit out of him. Because it wasn't my choice of duty as it ended up. It was the Navy's choice. And when it came for assignment in boot camp, uh, I went to boot camp in Great Lakes in uh, Illinois in the winter. It was brutally cold. But my, the choice of duty I was giving, given was on a destroyer escort in uh, February, in the um, March rather, in North, the North Atlantic with on-the-job training as a bosun's mate, chipping paint or something like that. Or my other choice was go to Monterey, California, to the Defense Language Institute, West Coast, and for 54 weeks, study North Vietnamese and become a linguist in the Naval Security Group. The North Atlantic in March, California, didn't, wasn't a big choice. I went to California figuring that by the time I finished school, the war might be over. And uh, it wasn't. And when the rest of my class of linguists went to spend the summer at Goodfellow Air Force Base in San Angelo, Texas, the anus of the United States, as they told me, uh, I had managed to wangle an appointment to Officer Candidate School in Newport, Rhode Island. So I went to spend the summer in OCS, writing to them asking how many tumbleweeds they chased that day while I had been out on Narragansett Bay practicing man overboard a drill with the fresh, cool breeze out of the north. You know, uh, 
Um, so I, uh, I, I actually started my military career as an enlisted man at the Defense Language Institute, West Coast, which was an army base, mind you. So I actually, even though I was in the Navy, I pulled army kitchen police. I stood army watch. I even took some advanced infantry training with the army at Fort Ord. I, was, I may as well have been in the freaking army at that point, but uh, I was in the Navy. Okay. Uh, I managed to wangle a commission. I had always dreamed of being a Naval officer. And I was looking forward to going to destroyer school and becoming a direct officer of what they call the direct officer of the line, eligible for command at sea. And the, uh, I remember the day the orders arrived uh, in the, uh, at OCS and uh, everybody except me got their orders in uh, the co company compartment. I was told I had to report to the old man down on the, uh, his office, captain's office. So I went down and the captain and I went in to see him and he looked at me and he said, I've been here for two years, Mr. Cutter. No ensign, newly commissioned ensign in that time has orders directly to Vietnam. You, Mr. Cutter, have orders directly to Vietnam and I would like to know why they are sending you to, directly to Vietnam. And I looked at him and I said, well, Captain, uh, if you look at my record, you'll see that I was an enlisted man and I went to the language school and I happened to be fluent in North Vietnamese. He looked at me and he said, well, that explains why they're sending you in as a Naval Intelligence Liaison Officer. Do, Mr. Cutter, you know the life expectancy of a NILO, Naval Intelligence Liaison Officer? And I said, well, Captain, the last I heard it was six to eight weeks. He looked at me and said, well, I'd like to wish you happy sailing and following seas and the old Navy tradition, but frankly, I don't think you've got a snowball's chance in hell of coming back alive. This was not encouraging. And when I went back to the company compartment and they asked, well, where did, what would he want to see you? I said, he wanted to give me my orders. And they said, well, where? I said, I'm going directly to Vietnam with a stop for a little pre-in-country training out in California. And they, I, I can remember the, uh, the chief petty officers who were in charge of the company, the old enlisted, senior enlisted, and the officers who were in charge of the company who had been pushing us through, just sort of looking at me and just not saying anything. Uh, it was a very strange feeling uh, to have been told that I probably wouldn't live through this experience and that no one said anything to me about it uh, when I got back and told them where I was, I was going. It's sounding a bit like uh, the beginning of Apocalypse Now. Uh, it, <laughs> never well, never I, get out of the boat. Yeah, well, I tell you, uh, I had signed up to God uh, to uh, go where the Navy sent me. And uh, I sort of just gulped and I, I told my parents and they kind of gulped. Uh, but I, you know, saddled up and went out to California for the uh, pre-Vietnam training, uh, which was interesting. Uh, I got the uh, intelligence training and uh, I got sent to SEER school, Survival, Escape, Resistance and Evasion, where I had the pre uh, interesting experience of actually being waterboarded as part of the prisoner of war camp experience. <laughs> Uh, the only thing that really taught me was I was determined I would not be taken prisoner. Uh, so that was always in the, the back of my mind that under no circumstances would I allow myself to be uh, uh, captured if I could, if I could prevent it in any, by whatever means. Uh, but it was, I can remember uh, you, one thing to, about the Navy, if you're the junior officer, you have to do all the chores for all the other officers. You're the one who gets the coffee, picks up their laundry and so forth and so on. Well, I'd barely been commissioned, you know, a month when I showed up for pre-Vietnam training uh, with the lieutenants and lieutenant commanders and what have you. And here I am, an ensign. And they took great pleasure in sending me to get coffee and uh, pick up their uniforms and what have you. And when I went to survival school, it was... 
about 120 enlisted men and four officers. The other three, of course, all outranked me. So at survival school, they would say, well, if we were out one night, we would have pitched our parachute tents by the sea uh, and in Southern California and by the, on the shores of the, of the Pacific, which is a very cold ocean, incidentally. And we had to forage for our meal that night in the water. And the other three officers looked at me and said, Ensign, you have to set an example for the enlisted men. Go forage in the water. So I stripped down and went out into the water. And there's, there's absolutely nothing there. I mean, they've been using this area for long enough. Even the fish knew to avoid it. So um, that night, we didn't have much of a meal. It was my 25th birthday. I can remember that. And then uh, the next day, we had an, were up in the mountains doing the same thing. And then we had the uh, evasion course where we had to evade the enemy for four hours and not get captured. Then we had the prisoner of war camp experience. And I can uh, remember, I can remember distinctly uh, that something had happened uh, and the other three officers had all gotten ill and were retching terribly uh, uh, because they couldn't face eating what, it, what was in front of them. But I just sort of ate it. And a chief petty officer, a senior chief came up and put his arm around me and whispered in my ear, Ensign, you'll do just fine. That meant more to me than anything else I had heard. Um, I finished the school. I was called into the captain's office at the end and I was told that uh, they had decided I was actually too junior as an ensign to be what they called a Naval Intelligence Liaison Officer. So they were just going to send me in country to operate, as he said, according to the needs of the service. Since I was already in the pipeline, they couldn't pull me out. So I, you know, I went in country, got on the plane, flew to Hawaii, flew to the Philippines. We landed in uh, Saigon, uh, Tonsonut, early in the morning. And a great big bus came to meet me. Big old Navy bus with barbed wire on the windows and all sorts of stuff to prevent anybody throwing anything in. I was the only Navy person on that plane. I was the only Navy person on that bus. They took me to the in-processing barracks, which was called Annapolis. And uh, I, I met, went in through my uh, stuff on a bunk and there was an officer there who'd been there 24 hours more who I knew who was now the old hand. He was a lieutenant. Uh, lieutenant. And he said to me, well, uh, Cutter, come along with me. We'll go over to MACV, Military Assistance Command Vietnam Headquarters, for the briefing uh, check-in. I, I said, okay. I hadn't any sleep, but what the hell. We went over there. We had three hours of briefing. Uh, the first was on getting to know the uh, Vietnamese people. Well, I'd spent a year getting to know the Vietnamese people. Our, native, our teachers were native Vietnamese in language school. The next uh, class was on first aid. Okay. The third class was how to order dishes, televisions, and anything else you wanted from the Pacific Exchange and have it sent home to mom and dad to be waiting for you when you returned. Then we were told, Ross and I, the other officer, that we were not needed for the rest of the day because the afternoon was going to be devoted to warning all the enlisted men about avoiding Vietnamese women and uh, socially transmitted diseases. And since we were officers, obviously, we were not in danger of any of that. So, okay, uh, we asked how we should get back to uh, the Annapolis barracks. And they said, well, there'd be no transportation until the enlisted men were finished. Well, I didn't like that much. So I said, there must be some other answer. And there happened to be a medic there that I knew from my enlisted incarnation who pulled me aside and he said, you can walk back easily. There's a hole in the fence behind Mac V headquarters, supposedly the most secure place in the nation, but there was a hole in the fence. And if we went out through the hole in the fence and followed the railroad tracks for about half a mile, we come to a, a piece of camo cloth tied to a tree. And if we turn there and follow that trail, it would bring us out through a hole in the fence at Tonsonut where we could go directly and would take us directly to the Annapolis barracks. So that's what we did. 
uh, you know, all of a sudden, the all everything that I'd heard about the secure stations and the great security and how well we were protected at any of the bases. So we didn't really have to worry that much about being attacked, just went out the window, literally just out the window. Well, we got back there and we had went to the pool. The other thing was, I was immediately amazed at how comfortable we had made ourselves in country. We had swimming pools, we had clubs right by the swimming pools, beer, hot dogs, whatever you wanted, hard liquor, all right there. Very. We spent the afternoon sitting by the pool, drinking. And then uh, we went on to uh, uh, that evening, my buddy Ross said, I'm going to take you for a treat. I'm going to take you to the Vietnamese Air Force Officers Club for dinner. I know right how to get there. Now, the VNAF Club, as it was called, had a reputation. It was said you could not go into the front door and go over to the bar in those dim lights without some bar girl undoing your zipper. So, okay, let's go to the VNAF club. So we got on the bus that Ross said we should get on. And uh, all, uh, he's sitting there talking to me about his experiences of having been in country for a whole 24 hours. And we drive out of the gate of Tonsonu. And I think to myself, this is strange. I would think the club would be on the base. And after a couple minutes, I mentioned to Ross that this didn't seem to be taking us to the base. And he looked out and around and no, it didn't. I went up and asked the driver where we were going. And we were going downtown Saigon, where we had no right to be. We had no orders. We had no weapons. We had nothing. And uh, we got down to downtown Saigon and Ross said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to sit on the bus and hope he takes us back. Well, the little bit of his driver came down and said he, he was getting ready to park the bus and we had to get off. So we got off in downtown Saigon. No idea how to get back. No idea where we were. Absent without leave. I hadn't been in country 12 hours and I was already AWOL. So the lieutenant was absolutely useless. Uh, he asked me what, what, what we should do. And I said, well, I'm going to walk across the street. And if I don't get killed going across the street, there's a big hotel over there. And I'm going to add, go over and see if I can promote us a ride back to uh, the base. So I went, we went over. We survived crossing the street, which was no small feat, mind you. And I went up to the desk in the hotel and I said, uh, When's the next bus back to the base? And the guys up there said, well, there's a bus leaving for Mac V out here in 10 minutes. I said, great. We went out, we went back to Mac V headquarters where we knew where we were, walked around the building, went out through the hole in the fence, down the trail and back through the hole in the gate to the Annapolis barracks. My God, I, 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 and no one had missed us. And this was my, my welcome to Vietnam. And in some ways, it was, in many ways, it was the high point because things went downhill after that. What was the sort of sentiment back home at this stage? If, if this was 72. This was 72. Uh, my father, as I said, was a minister. He had a church in uh, Old Newbury, Massachusetts, up on the coast. And the, the manse where he lived looked out over the village green. And one Sunday afternoon, I was sitting out there and I had on my uh, uniform as a, uh, a student uh, officer candidate, my whites. And there were some people playing football in the ground uh, on the green across from us. And one of them saw me and yelled, yelled out, hey, look over there, there's a baby killer. That's what the attitude was in the United States. The war was not very popular. Uh, people coming back from Vietnam were advised to have civilian clothes with them so they could change in the airport before they tried to negotiate the airport in San Francisco or Long Beach or wherever so they could avoid being singled out by the protesters. It was not a friendly time. And uh, my own homecoming when that, that occurred 10 months later was absolutely horrific. 
but uh, that was 10 months down the line. I had to get, get through the, my tour of duty in Vietnam, first of all. Uh, so um, coming out of uh, 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 MACV, the briefings there, they issued us our, our uniforms, our green utilities, and with our names all embroidered on them by the little hooch maids and what have you. And um, we were told that we could stand down because of uh, was, this was two days before Christmas. They, they weren't going to send anybody out on the day before Christmas or Christmas Day. No, there was going to be no transport available. Uh, and I was being sent up north to Da Nang, to uh, I Corps, Da Nang, Hue, Quang Tri, uh, to serve up there as an advisor of some sort. So, um, fine. I, if, the day before Christmas, first thing in the morning, I'm rousted out and I'm told to report to MACV headquarters. I get over there and they say, well, get back, get back, pick up all your stuff. We've, we've got you on a transport up to uh, Da Nang this afternoon. They need you up there sooner than we expected. They needed a, a translator. Okay. I went back, threw my stuff together. Everybody's looking at me. Uh, got my 45 and my M16 and all that crap they'd given me. Got out to the air base, got on the transport plane, C-130. Flew up to Da Nang. And, you know, they're coming in low and, you know, fast and real because they don't want to get rocketed coming in. So we land. We've already been briefed that they're going to land turn the plane around, push our luggage on the pallets off and we're to run off the plane because they're not going to stop. They're just going to turn around, push the pallets and begin to take off. And we got to run off the plane as fast as we can. So I did that, uh, got my stuff. I'm again, I'm the only Navy person on the plane. And I go over to the little uh, reception place they've got and go in to look for the Navy, Navy liaison. Well, it's the day before Christmas. So he took the day off. So there's nobody there to arrange for me to get any transportation. So uh, the uh, sergeant uh, in charge was not really very friendly looking at me as a very, very junior officer, uh, second lieutenant or a butter bar or an ensign, you know, one little gold bar. And so I played my enlisted man card that I'd spent a couple of years in enlisted man. He warmed up to that right away, recognized that I was what they call a Mustang in the Navy, having been enlisted and then commissioned. And he actually got a hold of the Navy liaison and I went and spent the night at the Navy liaison's barracks, so to speak. And then the next day, which was Christmas day, I uh, caught a, a Jeep ride over to the uh, Naval in, uh, installation at Camp Tinshaw, what had been Camp Tinshaw. Uh, now it was the Tinshaw Annex because so much had been turned over to the Vietnamese. And on the way over, I remember this distinctly, at one point we had to pull over to the side of the road. The, uh, it was a lieutenant who picked me up and um, he said, pull, pull out your weapon. And is it loaded? He said, yes. And I said, yes. He said, just range it back and forth. Don't let anybody come near the Jeep. We'd pulled over because an ammo train was approaching us coming from the, the docks and it was full of bombs and what have you. And he, as he said, if you see one coming, you pull over. You don't want to get in the way of an ammo train because they're not going to stop anything. And they came roaring by, kicking up all the dust and what have you. And we then continued on our way past the Vietnamese Rehab Hospital, which was known by the lovely name of Cripple Corner. And as we went by Cripple Corner, there were people out there with shovels scooping up the remains of the crippled Vietnamese who had been waiting for an ammo train to come by so they could throw themselves under the wheels and thereby get their families some monetary benefit from the American government. And uh, uh, I, I, I remember, you know, over there, there's, there's, a, there's a hand disconnected from any body and it's like this. And I'm, uh, you know, that be, became an appropriate representation of, of what I experienced in country in, in, in many ways. Um, I was a very junior officer uh, when I met the old man that uh, was going to advise me, the captain, of, he was actually a commander. 
um, and, and an alcohol problem. I can remember him looking, me, looking at me and saying, they sent me a goddamn ensign? What am I supposed to do with a goddamn ensign? I never, he never called me by name. I was always the goddamn ensign. And I ended up being the, the one uh, for those first month and a half I was there that they would send off when something needed to be done, something strange. Uh, a code machine had been left behind. They needed somebody to go up and pull it out of uh, where it had been left. Send me the goddamn ensign. They needed somebody to go up and assist somebody, uh, an American officer who was closing down or pulling the advisor out of the uh, uh, Vietnamese naval installation. They needed some extra hands up there. Send up the goddamn ensign. So I got sent to these uh, various places before I went off for this temporary duty. And then when I came back, um, it was same, I was, went back to the same unit and I was a, an advisor to, to directly with the Vietnamese working in their command center. But that was uh, what ended up being my cover job because I was uh, pulled aside by the XO and uh, asked if I uh, would do them a favor. And I knew that this was not going to be a good thing because this isn't the way that you're supposed to get orders and all this sort of stuff. But they had this small group of people and uh, uh, the Americans supplied them. And would I, uh, the guy who had been supplying them had gone home, but they still needed their supplies. But I uh, mind terribly supplying them. Uh, getting arranging for whatever they needed. And I said, sure, uh, whatever you want, I'll be glad to, you know, to, want me to do this? Uh, how, how does it all work? Who do I report to? Where do I, and you don't, uh, I was told you don't report to anybody. You meet this guy by the fuel dump. He, he goes by the name of Zipper, Zipper. Uh, zip was a uh, term we used to do, along with dinks and slopes to describe our allies, a pejorative term. I thought it really strange that I was going to meet a, meet a Vietnamese who went by the name of Zipper. But I did. He told me what he wanted. And it was all kinds of supplies ranging from ammunition to various other kinds of items. And uh, I went back to the executive officer and asked, well, what am I going? He said, get it however you can. And I said, okay, uh, I can get a lot of this at the BX, a base exchange from the Air Force or the Army Exchange, but I need some uh, funds to do that. And he gave me a big wad of military currency and said, here, use this. I said, okay, I'll need a pass. He said, here, gave me a little piece of blue paper that gave me an ensign the authority to go anywhere I wanted to and could commandeer anything I needed. I was dumbfounded. But I went off and I got the stuff and I came back and I said, okay, I've got the stuff. And he said, well, just keep on doing it and don't tell anybody what you're doing. Especially don't mention it to the, to the captain, to the commanding officer, because he doesn't want to know anything about it. Okay. So I kept doing this uh, after about a week or so, things developed in one way or another. And uh, I was given a list and uh, the zipper said, well, what do we do about these people? And I said, well, who are they? Well, they're, they're, they're VC. I said, well, they're, they're VC, do what you normally do, take care of it. And I went back and I, uh, I went into the XO and I said, this was a very strange uh, incident. Uh, and I described what had happened. And he just looked at me and said, you know what you've done. I said, I told them to take care of it, take care of them. The XO looked at me and he said, you signed their death warrant. And I said, wait a minute. And I, I, I looked at myself, what am I, what am I into here? And that's when he told me. It was the remains of, of what was called Operation Phoenix, which had been a pacification program uh, that had actually been very successful in what it was originally meant to do, although it was very brutal. Uh, Phoenix had been hit the American news 
in the 68, 69, something. And so it had been uh, officially, the Americans had said that they closed it down. It was no longer part of uh, the CORDS program, uh, the Civic Operations and Refugee Development Support Program. It was no longer connected with that. It had been closed down. At the same time as the SOG group, uh, uh, studies and operations group, which were uh, the uh, SEALs and what have you, those had also been closed down. So these, these programs that were so controversial and had such interesting reputations had been closed down. The re reality was nothing got closed down. Uh, they were all just given to the Vietnamese to operate as they would. And we continued to supply them and uh, kind of sign off on what they were doing, but without keeping any records. And that's what I backed into. So I continued to do that. Uh, at the, uh, I actually was given a two ammo boxes full of greenbacks, American hard currency, to support what I was doing. And along with that, the extra orders, let's say, not to keep records, not to tell anybody what I was doing. And I said, well, what if I run into something? He said, do what you think best. For God's sakes, I'm an ensign, barely commissioned three months and all of a sudden, I find myself deep in this. And the worst of part of it, well, the reality was I absolutely loved it. It was a rush. I wanted to know what they were doing. Uh, I was told that the guy who preceded me never really wanted to know, never asked questions. Well, I asked questions. I wanted to know what they were doing, how it was working. And so I would go out with them on an operation. And this was basically murder for hire. When you showed up at the place in the middle of the night, you went in, there were no, no survivors. Could be with family there, whoever, nobody survived, no witnesses. And when I asked why they killed everybody, they told me, too dangerous for you. You, you, no witnesses, we protect you. Right. So, shit. Uh, but as I, as I say, I got, it was a rush. During the day, I'd stand boring watchers or I'd do the, the watches, you know, there were two other guys, we'd rotate it through and then I'd go off and do this thing with the, this little group that I would meet always off base. Nobody would ask any questions because I had the piece of paper that let me go and do what I wanted to do. It was terrible. It was horrifying. It was, you know, I, I was not a stranger to combat because I was there two weeks before I was in my first firefight. And, uh, I'd been made the executive officer of a mobile response team, and that's another story altogether. But I was being sent up to a radar site with the Vietnamese, and there were two Jeeps, and I was in the second Jeep. The first Jeep of Vietnamese got ahead of us too far. They went around a corner, and we could hear the ambush. So when we came around the corner, you know, I'd gone through panic and fear, and I was just enraged that somebody was going to be shooting at me. So I rolled out of the Jeep and my, my M16 was on rock and roll. I took out black pajama over there, put in another clip, took out another one over there. The dog must have taken all, of, uh, you know, 45 seconds. It seemed like forever. And when I went out to search the first body, I found that I'd killed a 16. What was it? According to the idea, it was a 16-year-old girl. I did not envision that war included killing children. But it did more than once. It was 
ugly. It was brutal. The only thing that kept me alive was I fell in love with a Vietnamese woman. Something else you're not supposed to do. I inherited her literally from a chief petty officer that was going home and he would took me over and introduced me to his, his girlfriend, the house he'd set up for her in downtown Da Nang. It was easy to set up housekeeping with a local if you wanted to have a family, a little wifey over there, what have you. Well, he got sent back to the States and he gave me some stuff to take to her and I took it to her and found out that uh, he hadn't told her he was going home. And uh, I gave her back the key to the compound and she kind of looked at me and she said, you, 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 you come and visit me. And I said, well, I'd like to. I, it was nice to have some company that was, wasn't going to shoot at me. And so I said, well, you need the key. So she gave me the key and I took it. And over the course of time, I fell in love. And she did too, because she'd never met an American who first of all spoke her language. And I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, uh, brutal. I wasn't really, I, she recognized I kind of backed into this and, uh, she tried to seduce me a couple times. It really didn't work because I wasn't. Uh, that happened after a, a month or so when thing, uh, there was a, something went very wrong and I came back and all of a sudden she discovered that I wasn't, didn't have an office job. I showed up covered in, in blood from a nighttime operation. Uh, and... It, it was, she cleaned my clothes, I took a shower and things just progressed from there. But anyways, we, we became a, a couple and it was that, that tenderness, that, that, that sense of love of having somebody who uh, would, would, would hold me at night uh, that uh, enabled me to keep on, keep on going. It, it was so ugly what I was doing that I decided that uh, this uh, Lou, as I, Lou was her, her name, and I should uh, I, I would disappear into Thailand with her. So I made the arrangements. I had plenty of money, plenty of papers, plenty of contacts. Remember, I'm still only an ensign, for God's sake. But uh, and I told her what we were going to do. And I made all the arrangements and I came back and we were going to do it and she had disappeared. And I went into a blind panic trying to figure out what happened, what happened, whether she'd been arrested, swept up, brought up, caught up in a sweep. And I used every contact I had, black market and what have you, to try and find out. And uh, I never did find out what happened. I mistakenly at that point exposed myself a little bit uh, to the point where uh, black market was going to take advantage of me and the various knowledge I had of, of operations uh, and uh, my little group of assassins were getting even a little more out of hand and uh, People were being withdrawn right and left out of the country at that point. I kept asking, am I going soon? And the XO kept saying, you're not on the list to go anywhere. You're staying here. And uh, finally, I got a week of R&R &R in Thailand. So I went to Thailand for a week and had took the opportunity to kind of sort things out. And... Uh, The XO had been after me. He said, can't you close that little group of yours down and just sort of stop it? So I decided I could, and uh, I needed to take care of the black market people that were threatening me as well, one in particular. 
So I, uh, I'd made a discovery during my course of duty about how the targets were identified. And uh, it was actually through the black market that would hire the group to take care of somebody. And I actually tested this out by giving to the black market uh, operator I worked with, the chief one, the name of a Vietnamese gentleman I considered expendable. And two or three days later, that name appeared in front of me from my little group on a short list of people to be taken care of. So I signed him off. And in due course, my black market uh, operator came up to me and said, uh, your little uh, problem has been taken care of. And uh, at that point, I knew I was, I'd come in at both sides of the operation. And neither side knew I knew. So uh, what I ended up doing was uh, I told the little group over here of assassins that uh, the guy over here uh, was upset with something they had done and he was going to take care of them. And before they took care of him, they, uh, they, before he took care of them, they'd better take care of him. <laughs> so they arranged a, a fake rocket attack on his place of business. Uh, he lived over his supplies and uh, they actually blew him up. And then they told me what they'd done and I said, good. And then I killed all of them. I killed the team with a hand grenade. Um, I had to clean it up somehow. That was how I did it. And I didn't see any other way to do it. And then I went and I told the XO that uh, uh, the problem with the team was solved. He said, what did you do? And I said, you don't want to know. He said, well, I need to. I said, no, you don't want to know. What you do need to know is you need to expedite getting me out of country. And so they did uh, two or three days later of that, I was back in San Francisco, uh, getting an, on an airplane, fly back to Boston. My parents were going to pick me up at the airport. I got on this plane. It was one of these old planes with three seats on each side. And I got into a, a seat by the window and there were two seats empty beside me. And I'm sitting there uh, nursing a drink that the waitress had brought me, the stewardess had brought me. And this woman gets on with a young child, must have been, child must have been four or five, child runs down into the seat beside me because they're the only seats that are open. And I look down, oh, child, I smile, say hi. And I hear the mother say to the stewardess, you need to change our seats. I don't want my child to sit next to a baby killer. There it was. And there was more truth to it than I wanted to admit. And I knew then that... Uh, I was an alien in my native land, stranger, not welcome, not wanted. So I finished out my military, military obligation. I've been ordered, I've been offered because I graduated at the top of my class in OCS. I've been ordered a commission in the regular Navy, just as if I graduated from the academy, rather than the reserve commission, which OCS candidates would usually get. And that commission, that, uh, that paperwork caught up with me in Vietnam. And uh, I was told the old man wanted to see me right away. So I went in and I'd just come in from a night in uh, witnessing a questioning of a suspect. No one ever survived the questioning of a suspect. They didn't survive. No one survived the questioning. So I went in to see the old man, and I had blood on me. And he kind of looked at me, shooed me out for being unmilitary. And he threw these papers across at me and said, you can sign these, you can have a regular commission and be just like me. And I remember looking at him and saying to him, you son of a bitch, there's no way in hell I'm going to be just like you. And I was pulling out my uh, weapon, I was going to shoot him. And I said, I'm going to be a, I'm going to be a minister just like my father. This was a great surprise to me. I never thought of this. And, uh, uh, you know, when I said it, uh, anyway, uh, the XO wrapped, wrapped me up and pulled me out. And, you know, uh, no, nothing ever came of it because if they brought charges, they would have had to uh, 
take the chance that I would talk about what I was doing, and no one wanted to do that. So it just got all got forgotten. And uh, the CEO never spoke to me again, and I never spoke to the CEO. So uh, I went, you know, I went back, you know, I turned down the commission. I'd always dreamed of being a Navy officer for a career. That was out. I thought to myself, well, what have I just said? I've said I'm going to be a pastor like my father. Where the hell did that come from? What is God thinking? You know, uh, uh, anyways, I came back to the United States, filled out my military obligation. I'd be damned if I didn't go to seminary. It's been the, my, my professional career as a clergyman. Uh, this gave me some problems uh, because uh, I was keeping a secret. I didn't want people to know exactly what I'd done in country. Uh, I never told my family. I got married, I had children. I never told my wife. Uh, and uh, until I was, I was beginning to have severe flashbacks, uh, my children were scared of me because I'd have these rages and I'd go off to isolate myself because I didn't want to hurt anybody because I'd survived in Vietnam by having rage. You know, I couldn't have any other emotion, but if I became angry, so I spent a lot of time being angry, and I could, if a situation arose, I could actually feel a white hot heat in the back of my neck. And uh, then I could literally kill without feeling anything until later, and then I would drink. Um, I've told this story uh, in the retreats that we've led with, with uh, uh, over the years, a spiritual tree, healing retreats for veterans and their wives. And um, uh, they just kind of look at me. I, I never thought my story was unusual. I thought it was, you know, until the first time I told it, which was when I first, you know, I'd been a minister for, for a number of years. And uh, I had moved to a large church in Duluth, Minnesota, hoping to hide in the cold weather of Minnesota from the flashbacks that I was having. That didn't work too well. Um, and I was, I'd been there three months and I was in the middle of tremendous flashbacks. And on my desk, there was a, a, my predecessor, the interim had left a folder of resources and I pulled one up and it was talked about the local vet center. Veteran Senate, these had been started for Vietnam veterans. And I looked at it and I finally staggered down into it. And uh, they sat me down and we began to talk and they wanted to commit me to a psych ward. Uh, but I didn't have time for that. I had four funerals I had to officiate at, all of them veterans. And uh, well, they put me in an in-country group, in-country combat group, and we were talking about it and talking about things, but I would sit there very quietly and listen because I didn't want to talk, because uh, I didn't know how to talk. And uh, I got a letter passed on to me about this group of Vietnam veterans who were also clergy that had formed the year before, and they were having a meeting over in Chicago. And if I wrote to this guy, Father Phil, I might be able to join the group. So I wrote to him and he said, well, you certainly qualify. Your DD-214 is you just need to send me $50. So I sent him 50 bucks and signed up for their conference over in Illinois. It was an outside of Chicago. And I went, I had to get permission from the vet center to go and from my in-country combat group. I had to get permission to meet a meeting, so I explained, and the vet center said, well, we can, can we call this Father Phil and check it out? So they called Father Phil, Phil Selwa, and uh, they called me out, this was a legitimate group, and they said, and, and Father Phil happened to work with the VA. He was a chief a chaplain at the Boston VA, so they said, my counselor said to him, she told me this later, she said, I said to Father Phil, there's something really bothering him and we can't crack him because he knows all the tricks. See if you can crack him open and get him to talk. So I get over there uh, and we go through uh, the, the, the five or six days of the conference and it starts with a sharing time of everybody telling who they are, why they're there. And I said I was there to learn about the group. 
And I didn't say much else, but uh, Father Phil kept trying to crack me in various ways. And finally, he decided the only way he could do it. Um, and and uh, Phil Salwa, uh, for a Catholic priest, mind you, is a crafty son of a bitch. And he ambushed me. He literally announced one evening that he did not feel that all of the attendees had given uh, shared sufficiently of their stories, so they were going to have a special sharing session <clears throat> that evening. And everybody was to show up at 7.30 in the conference room. Uh, I went up to my room and I knew he was going to, I, I knew what he was doing. I knew it. I'm no fool. If I was a fool, I wouldn't be here. Uh, um, I, I packed my bags and I said, I, I call cut and run. Like, and I said, no, I cut and run out of this. I came here to see if I couldn't do something positive. Let me see if, if I can gut it out and just get through this. We'll see what he's got in hand. So I went down at 730. He had everybody else come down half an hour earlier so he could brief them on what he was doing. Had the room set up, circle, candles going, incense burning, Lights turned down low. He'd chosen the music, and uh, uh, he had two people primed to speak, one who had actually been at my lie, another who had been a helicopter pilot pulling people out of, after they'd been shot down. He had them speak, and uh, then he played uh, a song from Les Mis, uh, Empty Chairs at Empty Tables, Where Have All My Friends Gone? And then he looked... Uh, Thing into, I'm sitting directly across from him, and he looks at me and raises his eyebrows as if to say, well, and I look back at him, and I was, I was in agony. I, I was just torn up, and I said to myself, fuck it. And I threw off my glasses, and I put them down, and I told them about my, what had happened. And later I was told, I thought I spoke for about five minutes. I was told I spoke for over an hour. Uh, a, another Catholic priest who had been a chaplain in country a number of years later uh, asked me about what I had thought about that experience. And I looked at him, I said, well, tell me what you thought. He said, you scared the shit out of me. I'd never heard anything like that. But I told what I had done. And it put me so far outside what you'd call the box of expectations of what would happen what would happen, what should have happened, that I, you know, I, I sat there and, you know, I'd, I'd been pushed to the edge of, of almost what you might consider treason. And I, so I finally just admitted it and I just sat back and thought, okay, now they're all going to kill me. And that's fine. Uh, but what happened was uh, we were all chaplains, religious people, uh, of various denominations, and uh, bread and wine appeared, and we had what you might call a, a, a ritual of communion, sharing a, a sacred moment, and I became part of the group. And the question was that they asked Phil the next day, well, how do we know that we've actually helped Alan? And they said, well, you'll know if he comes back to our meeting next year. I went back for the next 20 odd years. I never missed a meeting. This was the only group I had that I could have a reunion with because I did not relate to any other group in country. I've since been invited to have a reunion with some CBs, and I've been invited to occasionally have a reunion with a group called the Big Look Spooks, who were listening spies on the Connie, the Big Plains, or the uh, listening stations on the ships that I trained with. They were the other linguists. They invited me to come back to their group. So I have a, can occasionally sit in with the Big Look Spooks or the, uh, uh, the CBs from uh, Camp Tinshaw. Um, and they're glad to have me there because I can tell them what happened at the very end of the camp that they had built. But other than that, other than this minister's group, I had no one to have a reunion with. So these were my reunions. And out of those, that group arose, arose our, our retreat program that Martin came to. Uh, where we, were, we began to run uh, retreats for people who were suffering from war trauma, and we would talk to them about uh, a healing path, a path of hope, some way to find some sense of wholeness with who you are, and 
reclaim uh, the promise of life or be able to get on with living, uh, open yourself up to accepting challenges. And uh, um, we'd actually been challenged to create this program by the psychologists and the psychiatrists who were working with PTSD at the Boston VA and internationally, the International Society of Traumatic Stress Studies. They came to us in our little group of clergy veterans and said, we can treat the, uh, the various presenting issues, but at the heart of, of PTSD, we've discovered uh, that it is basically a wound of the human spirit. And this is your specialty. So would you guys might kindly do something. So we've created a retreat program. And to our great surprise, it, it worked. And people would come to us that had never, and we would always have them come with a partner if we could, with a spouse or whoever they lived with, because we wanted to create a base community of at least a couple of people that they could talk with. And they, we would have World War II veterans come with their wives of 40, 50 years, and their wives would say during the course of the retreat, he's never said anything like that to me. He's never told me that story. Part of what we were doing was telling stories. Father Phil once said to me in a drunken moment, a very drunken moment. Uh, uh, he said, the only thing we have to give each other is our stories. And that was just before I told the next time I told my story because he ambushed me. But that's true. The only thing we really have to give are our stories and how they reflect on our lives and what we've done with our lives. The challenges, as you use the word, the, use the, word, the, word term, the challenges that you accept, accept along the way, the risks that you're willing to take the uh, hope that you can find uh, when you don't have to cons- be all consumed with trying to keep something a secret, trying to not let out who you are. If you can accept who you are, what you've done, and uh, recognize that within that human experience, you are not unique, uh, and that others have gone down that pathway before, and you need to learn from that pathway. If you can take that, that hope that they, there's learning out there, and if you can be, open yourself to taking the risk of getting, of, of, of things being better, of some sort of healing coming uh, down the line, then, then, you, then, then you can live. And uh, I call it living by uh, uh, serendipity. Because I'm, a, as I said, I'm, a, I'm kind of a control freak. I like to manage things. And I tried to do that with my family. It didn't work well. I tried to do that in Vietnam with disastrous circumstances. Um, finally, I came to the point where I will set things up as much as I can. I'll make arrangements, but I have no predetermined outcome of anything. Uh, if something good comes out of it, it's serendipity and it's a gift to me. And I take it, I take it all as a gift. As a matter of fact, that's how I've had to take life Uh, because coming back from Vietnam and uh, finally I came to the spot where I had to find resolution with the uh, 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 woman I'd fallen in love with in Vietnam. I had to come to some sort of a conclusion about that. So I did uh, uh, find a conclusion that gave me permission to accept uh, the love that we had, but to move on. And I had to come to some sort of a conclusion with my own family, uh, my children and uh, my wife, about being honest with them about what I'd done and who I was and why I was so controlling. And you have to, they helped me give that up. I gave them permission to be my partners in my own healing journey. They had a phrase they could use. And if they used that phrase, it told me I was off going off the deep end again. And I had to go talk to my counselor because something was wrong. And so they knew they were my partners. And this began when my kids were in junior high school. So they, were, they know that dad's had some problems for a while. And it's okay, because I've also seen in my ministry and what I've done, working with other veterans, working with Phil and our, our group, we've helped people along the way. Uh, we've, we've given them encouragement. We've opened them up to say that, you know, you can go through some terrible shit. And it is shit. Uh, but everybody's got shit. Uh, I, I, because I you use religious terms, uh, uh, I, I define sin for them as shit. Everybody's got it. 
Everybody has to deal with it, but nobody likes to talk about their shit. And it's the same with sin. So I, you know, I can relate. It's just like grace. Uh, again, I'm coming from a religious background. Grace, I define as grease, because I can talk to any veteran and say, okay, what do you do with your weapon to keep it operating it? You, t- you take good care of it, and that includes you have to get it, get it, keep it well greased so it operates. That's what God's grace is all about. It's the grease we get in our lives to keep us operating. It's messy. It's dirty. It'll leave a stain. Don't think the great, great, great grace is pure. It's not. It's just like grease. It's messy. It's just like shit. It'll leave a stain, but it'll change your life. And that is kind of the, the, the approach that we took in our retreat. We never tried to sell who we were as religious people. In fact, we try and lay down our religious identities as soon as we could and identify more as uh, from our veteran uh, identities because we didn't, we weren't, we didn't want to make a body count for Christ. We've done the body count business already. We weren't in the making body count for the, uh, for the church, but we were there doing there out of our varied religious, varied backgrounds. We're trying to help our uh, brothers and sisters who were veterans claim the fullness of life, live up to the promise of life, get enjoyment out of life, live life to the fullest possible way that you, you could. And we tried to show, give them ex- examples and telling our own stories about our own lives and how they changed for the better. And the great enjoyment we got out of doing what we did and the great enjoyment we get out of seeing what they do with their lives as, as many of them are still in touch with us in uh, a variety of ways. Uh, on email, on Facebook, uh, writing letters, what have you. And it's just wonderful to see how people have come to the retreats and uh, actually been helped along the way. Uh, That's really, and, you know, if I were to bring my life into a circle, that's what my my parents wanted more than anything else for my brother and me. They wanted wanted us to be happy in our lives. And they want us to, to, to know the, the joy that comes in, in helping other people and being servants, which was part of our, our faith tradition. And uh, that has been the, the story that I've, I've tried to live out, and I continue to try and live it out, because I, I've still got at least 20 good years ahead of me. I'm only 75. I mean, geez, I can keep on going forever. Uh, so I keep telling myself, even though I know it's not true, but I, I just keep going, going on because uh, uh, I wake up in the morning and every day is a gift to me. Uh, I went, went in country with the idea that I was not going to survive. And it was affirmed to me by more than one or two people. And uh, those uh, guys that I went uh, through training with, uh, intelligence training, uh, there are two of them back in uh, uh, San Francisco, the guys that went on to be Nilos. Neither of them came back. Of the three of us, I'm the only one that came back. The sole survivor. And I'm the sole survivor of a couple operations that I was involved in. There's a burden with being a sole survivor. Um, The ghosts come and visit you sometimes. That was terrifying. Hungry ghosts is a phrase in Vietnamese culture, in uh, Buddhist tradition in some ways. The hungry ghosts will come and get you, the animists. Uh, And I experienced those hungry ghosts until uh, finally I made friends with them. And they no longer come as hungry ghosts. They still come. Uh, But they're not, they're they're, they're coming at more, they're, they're my companions on the journey now. And it's a different relationship. Uh, I, I, like anybody, uh, I, I, I can talk of a purely practical, rational side of things, but also I have uh, my own experience of, of mysticism and uh, my own uh, uh, spirituality that I fall back on, uh, I, I, that I enjoy tremendously. Uh, I'm, a, I, uh, I'm a Presbyterian Buddhist. I went to retreats with uh, uh, the community of Thich Nhat Hanh and actually went to a retreat with him and have always been a great admirer of his uh, uh, writings. One of the things that he said to Vietnam veterans, because uh, he'd always have them sit up front at his uh, retreats when they were there, he wanted to talk to them, especially, and he'd say, 
You are the burning light at the tip of the candle. Only you with the horrors of who you have been and where your stories. Only you can tell the truth, the truth about war and chaos. And to some extent, I think that's true. Uh, uh, there are some parts of the experience that uh, civilians will never understand. But they can touch. They can touch it. And maybe for a brief moment, they can get a glimpse of it in uh, reading a story or in seeing a movie like Martin's Penitent. Uh, maybe they can get a touch of it. And if they can, that's great. And if I and my other veterans in our group have been able to contribute to that, we could ask for nothing more. Yes, Martin's... Um done incredibly well hasn't he to come through what what he's been through yeah and we've enjoyed him so much yes it, it has been a, a joy to uh uh to, to watch him to uh listen to his stories to exchange viewpoints back and forth it is just uh uh one of the uh, great joys uh I hope to get over to, to Cornwall sometime and actually to drop in on him. Uh, got a friend down in Australia. Uh, I've got a standing uh, offer to come down and visit with the Australian veterans down there. I'd love to go, be able to go and do that once this COVID business has reaches a place where I can travel again freely. But I'd love to go and meet with some of these people that I've uh, uh, been in touch with over the years and get a chance to sit down and talk with them again and see what challenges they found in their lives and how they've, how they've met them, how they've, uh, what they've accomplished. Why do you think it is that some veterans reach out for help or start looking for the answers and, and, and others don't make it? I think, uh, 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 well, uh, again, speaking from my own experience, my pain was so great. Uh, my own conflict within myself was so great that I knew I either, either it was going to, I was going to find a way out or I was going to destroy myself one way or the other, be it by drinking or by suicide. And um, my motivation, my motivation was I was not going to let that war kill me. So I was going to do whatever I could to reclaim some sort of fullness of life so that that on one part the pain was so great it kept me moving to look for something but there was also the determination that there was actually something more than what i was experienced experiencing there was something more out there for me but i had to find it somehow and so i decided that i would take the risk you know, to go down to the vet center, to go into the in-country group, to go to the, the plane, to take any risk I could, knowing that there were always a chance that I would be ambushed again and thrown back a step or two, but also knowing that there was a greater chance that something good would come of it. And my experience has been, yes, there are times when you, you have to step back and go and talk to somebody and that's okay because that's who we are. We need to talk to people. We need help along the way. We need people we can depend upon. But also, you need to, there's something more out there for us. And you, you need to keep reaching for it and reaching for it. Uh, uh, I call it uh, uh, hope and healing. And I've actually used that in a book title, Hope and Healing for the Journey or something like that. I could have used the third word and that would have been love. Because what you eventually discover is, uh, in hope and healing, uh, a power that is uh, greater than what you imagined. And it comes under the rubric of or the, the word that we would define as, as love. And so when I meet with uh, veterans, when I talk with them, uh, I find many veterans that are stuck. Uh, they've gotten a little bit of progress but they don't think there's something more and they're afraid that if they feel a little bit better, if they take the next risk, they'll lose what they've got. Well, it's, you, you can't hold on to things like that because then they, that what you're holding on to like a secret begins to define who you are. You've always got to take the next step. 
and the next step. And so that's what I firmly believed is that I have to keep taking that next step, that next step, that next step with whoever God puts in my uh, uh, place and circumstances put into my place. There's always a next step. And there's always going to be some serendipitous surprise for me along the way. Yes. Do you think if we, um, Alan, if we buy into a, let's just call it a victim identity, that's going to um, shackle us from, from finding this love that you, that you talk about? Yeah, so I, 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 being a, a, a victim uh, creates its own set of boundaries, its own little box. No one's meant to live in a box. We're all meant to open the box and, box and reach outside. I could have, you know, uh, just set myself up uh, to be always bitter about uh, the, the various things I fell into, uh, the various decisions I made that brought on some of those uh, hard uh, times to myself, because I didn't make good decisions all the time. I made some horrendous decisions. But I, I, I refuse to think, uh, think of myself as, as a, a, a victim. Uh, uh, I would rather be a perpetrator of good than a victim uh, confined by the evil that others, perhaps, or myself, I've done to myself. I'd always rather be reaching out and trying something new, uh, taking some new risk, going to some new spot, having some new adventure, uh, than trying to just exist in my own little box of and wallow in my own pain. I see too many people that wallow in their, their lives are defined by their bitterness and pain. And it's not, not just veterans. Uh, it's it's uh, other people in a variety of circumstances who are, are hurt and then are scared to go past the hurt, the fear of being hurt again, or taking the risk of being hurt again. It, it's, not, it's not risk, not, that's not living. That's existing. It's not even really, it's barely surviving. And there's so much more than survival. Yes. I'm thinking too that we, we hear a lot now, don't we, about being present, living in the, in the present and appreciating the beauty of, if you want to call it God or nature or spirit, or, and of course, for, for veterans, a, a lot of your identity is hammered into the past. Mm -hmm. And my past has always missed me with me, but I'm always mindful that I'm not living in my past, but I'm mindful that I'm living in today. And uh, 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 Dick Hans mind, uh, mindfulness, the, the way we see mindfulness uh, coming out in a variety of spiritual paths whatever uh, uh, the spiritual path or path you follow is, uh, is uh, you know, the, the, I think the real gift is really living, uh, being very aware of where you are at the moment and uh, uh, not making uh, big plans for the future, but just, you know, I make little plans. I don't make big plans. Uh, uh, given my uh, physical limitations, uh, I know that uh, every day can be kind of an adventure. It depends on how well the medications are working. Uh, so I, I, uh, I make little plans and enjoy them. Uh, now, I could, do have some big plans like going to Australia or what have you, uh, or walking part of the Camino, Camino Santiago in, in, oh, in northern Spain. I'd like to do that. Uh, but that, those are big plans. But uh, day by day, I live by the, uh, you know, just savoring every moment that comes and looking for the gift that each person will bring to me. Uh, like I discovered a whole new bunch of gifts through, through looking at some of your uh, short videos. I mean, those are just fascinatingly fun. Yeah. It's my gift to, it's my gift to you, Alan, and to, to everybody. I, I think, um, it's like you say, it's, it's about love and, it's about giving and not not keeping 
not keeping things too close to your chest. Yes. And it, well, and it's also about uh, feeling free to take the risk just to have a conversation and tell a story. You wouldn't believe in front of me the number of uh, four by five cards that I wrote out that uh, to, to prompt my memory along the way or to uh, cover certain things to make sure I did them in order or, or what have you. And I haven't looked at one of them in part because I don't have my glasses on because they always reflect in the uh, screen from the ambient light. And without my glasses, uh, uh, I couldn't read the damn cards anyway. So I've just been sitting here telling a story, having a conversation, and uh, being content to let it be what it is. And that's got part, of, part of the gift, is being content to just do it and let it be. Yeah, I often say to guests when they, they're a bit... Um how can we say, resistant. I say, do you prepare to, you know, if you walked into the bar and met one of your brothers or your, your veteran sisters, do you, do, you, do you prepare for that? And they're like, no. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah, I was, I was uh, using that image earlier today because I was looking at all this stuff that, that I'd gotten out and I thought to myself, eh. Trying to do that is my uh, obsessive compulsive self taking control. And uh, I don't like that self all that much. So let's just go with it and see where it, uh, it, it, it takes us. And um, it's a story. And there are all kinds of parts to the story. As my children uh, often say, when somebody asks me a question, they'll, they'll, they'll say, don't ask him that. He's going to tell a story. And it'll go on and on and on. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, even with my buddy, Father Phil, who you'll talk to, uh, I know Phil so well, and we have told each other's story so often that both he and I can repeat each other's stories back to each other and call each other out when say, you forgot to put them that part about when you, you know, <laughs> but we, we have worked together for so long and uh, have in spite of our, 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 we have differences, of course, but we have such a tremendous love for one another that we 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 cherish the moments that we can get together, and uh, we still do. You know, uh, among the veterans of our conference, uh, there are many that are remain dear to me uh, that I communicate with uh, in a variety of ways. Many veterans that uh, you just meet in the, along the way, and all of a sudden they're part of a, a larger extended. Uh, a spiritual journey, experience of life, human experience. Spirituality is the human experience of the whole human person. Whole human person, not just part person, the whole person, the good, the bad, the ugly. God knows I'm ugly. <laughs> uh, Alan, can we, um, or can you clarify for us? So this, this black market, operation is it is this what we would know as the phoenix operation phoenix or, or was it a similar oh, uh, phoenix was its own uh, little thing with uh, uh identifying the local uh, uh leadership the uh, the the uh tax collectors uh the the vc tax collectors who would collect the funds in each village if you could identify them and uh, pacify them, neutralize them, take care of them, get them to rally to Chiu Hoi was the Vietnamese word to rally to the cause and become part of the South Vietnamese uh, thing. That was one thing. If you couldn't get them to rally, you just kill them. Um, that was very effective. We actually, uh, in the Operation Phoenix, we pretty much wiped out the VC infrastructure, the Viet Cong infrastructure in South Vietnam. But we didn't realize that they, they were all replaced by the North Vietnamese Army infrastructure. So well, uh, we thought we were fighting the Viet Cong, we were actually fighting the NVA, and it didn't dawn on anybody immediately or for a long time, if ever. Uh, th that was one thing entirely unto itself. Uh, uh, the uh, you had over here the Operation Phoenix working through cords and uh, uh, the SAW group, the Sp uh, Studies and Operations group. They th that was very much coordinated with the CIA, the company, and what have you. 
and the other intelligence agencies. Oh, the black market is a uh, law unto itself. I do not think there is a war zone that does not have an active black market of some, uh, some sort. You just have to make the right uh, uh, touches along the way and make the right people. Uh, for example, uh, uh, I was, uh, we advisors were dependent upon the South, v South Vietnamese Navy for all of our supplies, our vehicles. So we would get these old beat up Jeeps that they, even the Americans didn't want. But if we wanted to have it really fixed up, we would drive the Jeep into downtown Da Nang, leave it on a corner, call a certain number, the black market would pick it up and then in three or four days, we'd have a nice new refurbished, rebuilt Jeep. And you'd pay for it out of rec funds, call it basketball supplies or something like that. No, the black market was the way that you would procure what you needed that you couldn't get through normal channels or procure what you wanted that you couldn't get through normal channels. And the black market, you had people that were uh, winked at by the, uh, 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 the governments, let's say, and the, by the military. And you had people that operated way outside that would uh, take care of some of the weirder needs that the black market would su uh, could supply, heroin, hard drugs, and what have you. Uh, so the, 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 the uh, Phoenix was one thing, uh, the black market was something else. Uh, I happened to be uh, working on in both areas, uh, just sort of fell into them, backed into both of them in some way. And uh, I will say, uh, as, I, I, as I, uh, people find it difficult to understand, but it, war was a real rush in many ways. It was, it was exciting. It was fun. You, uh, for, for an ensign, I had so much power. I, you know, the unexpectedly, I, I, I just, <sighs> um, it almost destroyed me. Uh, but that doesn't say there was not enjoyment in doing what you were doing. Um, there's nothing more satisfying, let's say, than setting an ambush and seeing it work. Now that's difficult to explain uh, to uh, people, but it's true. It's true. And for people who talk about the, uh, uh, and, uh, the terrors of war and the horrors, damn it, there are also some pretty good times that you can find in a war zone. And there are relationships that are Fleeting temporarily, you may only know somebody by a nickname, but that is somebody that you know by a nickname that you've gone through a firefight with is your friend for life, and you'll never forget that person. And if you happen to save each other's life, so much the better. No, no, may never touch, but they're part of you, and you're part of them. There's something, something about that experience that we don't seem to capture in civilian life, that intensity of, 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 of war, that, that it, it's the ultimate experience almost in mindfulness of that living moment by moment, second by second. And uh, there are some times where uh, sitting in a committee meeting where you, you really say, oh God, I miss that, <laughs> you know, but uh, because, uh, because, in some ways, I think those of us who have been to war have received that gift of really, if we have the courage, knowing how to value each moment. But it takes, it, it takes I think, courage. As I tell people, take, going to war, you know, you're scared, you're frightened, but you still go over there. You, it could take some courage. It takes even more courage to risk coming home and living life fully. That, that's a, the real courage that veterans need, is the courage to come home. And Greg, take that, 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 that love of life, that immediacy of life, that, that, that sheer wonderful moment, and, and, and expect to experience it in life as a gift. Because it is there. It is. Can you um, shed some light? It was William Colby, was it? The director of the CIA 
Yes. Back at this time, and he he met an untimely end, was it, in in his canoe? Yeah, there's something like that. Um, I always felt a little strange about... uh, uh, meeting people who worked uh, for the company, let's call them. Um, uh, and actually, in the community where I live here in Florida, we actually have a couple people here who work for the company in, uh, uh, let's put it, uh, more restricted modes than field work. And in some ways, they seem seem so... They see so so caught up, so limited. They they they're they're very cautious. They're not willing to take uh, uh, real. Uh, their, their lives are are very prescribed by the limits they set for themselves, rather than letting life be and uh, taking the risk to see, hell, what what box can I break out of now? What limit can I go past? What expectation can I go past? People don't expect me to do this. How can I push myself? That's why I went down. Uh, uh, when I said it was 73, I began to I get back on the stage and did improv comedy. You know, <laughs> you don't expect people at my age to get up and uh, especially when you're walking with two canes or a walker and get up on a stage, throw the canes away and fall down on the ground and make a joke out of it. But, but, but that's improv. You know, you do what you do. Just let go. Build the story. I think many people would say improv is braver than being in Vietnam, getting up yeah, on that stage. I, I, I don't know about that. It, it takes a certain amount of willingness to uh, make an absolute, complete fool of yourself. Mm-hmm. But in some ways, I've been doing that all my life, so what, what the hell? Yes, it was, uh, Sebastian Junger, wasn't it, that said we need to answer that question that... Um, you can take a man out of the war, but you can't take the war out of the man. And so, um, in, in some ways, the war is is always with me because it helped define me as the person I am now. And for that, uh, and for the five years that I spent on active duty, I remain immensely grateful and immensely proud of the time I spent in service. Uh, there were hard times, yes. There, uh, there were strange times. But they helped define me and challenge me to uh, become the person I am. And um, uh, also not to be defined by solely that experience, uh, but be, to let other experiences come. I've never seen such gentleness as I have had in, uh, as in combat. Have you read Matterhorn? Matterhorn. Uh, the, the name uh, uh, rings a bell. I don't know if I've read it or not. Uh, is, it, is it something to do with climbing the mountain? No, it's, um, it? well, it is a mountain, but it was one of the names given to the peaks in Vietnam, up in the, I'm guessing, up in the, in the high country. And it was written by I a chap. Yeah, written by a former Marine called, I believe it's Carl Marlantes. I've read, I've read some stuff by the Marlantes, yes. Mm. Uh, and I, I may have read that. I have to admit that uh, sometimes my memory is not too great for what I've, I've read over the years. Uh, but I, the Carl Malentes, I've read some of his writings. I don't know if I've read that one, but I, have read, I know I've, I've read a couple of his books. Uh, just like I've, um, I have to admit, uh, people ask me about what uh, they ask me about what my favorite movies are. I, I've never seen any of the Vietnam movies other than Forrest Gump. Uh, I don't, I don't do movies well. Uh, 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 sometimes I, I, I know I'll get into a movie and I'll get ambushed and so, sometimes that's not, I have to deal with that. Uh, in some ways, I am a little bit protective of what I see and what I read. Uh, I, I need to know that if I'm going to see something or read something, I've got to be in a safe place or have a trusted companion with me. So I am. Uh, I have learned that there are certain things I have to do, uh, and especially to have a trusted companion like my wife with me. Uh, so if something does happen, she can 
help me get out of it mm. or cover for me so I have enough time to do it. Run my repair tapes, as I call them. Because I can still get, just like anybody else, I can still get caught, ambushed, and thrown back. And was it a, a, was it a big battle to get over the alcohol? I gave up drinking uh, for about 13 years altogether because it was getting in my way of uh, what I was trying to do as a, a pastor in the church. Uh, uh, however, when we went to France, to, to Paris, I had always promised myself a bottle of wine in its native habitat. So I did what I did, uh, I had done in country. I would have a card in my pocket, and every time I had a drink, I would make a little mark. And I promised that out of uh, myself, out of a bottle of wine, I would have two drinks. So I had that card in my pocket, and that's what I did. And uh, coming out of that, uh, I discovered, uh, oddly enough, that uh, I can have a bottle of wine and it will not affect me too, other than get me relaxed. Uh, and I can't have an occasional cocktail. And I do. Uh, but in my mind, I'm always mentally ticking uh, it off because when I was doing this in country, where drinking was very heavy. I knew, especially when I was with the Vietnamese, as I was most of the time, I always had to be, I would always be the least drunk or the most sober. Let me put it that way. And I made sure that I was always the most sober and they were always more drunk than I was. I supplied them with a lot of booze to make sure that happened. Uh, but I'm very, again, I'm very mindful of, of that. And uh, so I'm very aware of uh, being very cautious. Uh, when I gave it up for the 13 years, uh, I didn't miss it that much, frankly. Uh, I think I, I, I filled that spot with chocolate milkshakes, which didn't help my weight any, but... <laughs> Satisfy one habit, bad habit for another, let's say. Yeah, you're probably not going to wake up feeling so guilty after knocking back a few milkshakes as you are, uh, you know, some Johnny Walker. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the great thing about being uh, retired now and uh, living in, in community, <coughs> as uh, we do, actually, we literally live in a community. I'm living the dream of my youth. I'm living in a commune with people all around me, and we all share our drugs. Because we're all taking medications, and some of us are taking the same medications. So if you run out, you go to your neighbor and say, do you have any extra warfarin? My prescription hasn't come there yet. Or do you have any extra cinnamon? My uh, Parkinson's meds haven't come. We all share our medications. <laughs> no, it, it, it's, a, it's a dream of my youth. Living in a commune. As we're both uh, authors, and as we've got a debt of gratitude for Martin, Martin Webster. Mm -hmm. This one arrived a couple of days ago. Ah, yes, I have that on my bookshelf. Yes. Yes. Really looking forward to oh, reading it for friends at home. If you're not, if you haven't seen my podcast with Martin Webster, I think we've done three now. Martin was the chap that um, had a witch hunt out for him after he was filmed or footage of him was shown in the news of the world. And he was making comment in Iraq on mm -hmm. some uh, locals, some young Iraqi locals that his regiment had grabbed hold of in a sort of snatch squad operation. And, um, Martin subsequently just went through hell with both the, the military and the media. And, mm -hmm. and he's now a, uh, an award winning film director. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Martin, just to say, thank you very much for putting Alan and I in, in touch, really looking forward to, uh, to reading your book. And Mar um, Martin, Martin is marvelous. Uh, as, as we say, he's, he's just our, 
uh, he, he's our, our, our new person who will put us in contact with the, the film world and what have you. His, his uh, capabilities are, are just blossoming now. I can hardly wait to see his next productions. Yeah, he's a great guy, but uh, don't ever lend him any money. <laughs> uh, well, would that I had the money to lend him, I would freely do so. Alan, listen, I'm going to put links for, for your books below this podcast so people can, um, can get a hold of them. Uh, do, did you want to give a shout out for your organization if, if it can help? Help any Our veterans. organization, uh, which was called the National Conference of Vietnam Veteran Ministers, laid at the International Conference of War Veteran Ministers, has pretty much ceased to exist. We were so, getting so old, uh, we timed ourselves out, and uh, we have such trouble even uh, getting a time to get together. So other organizations have picked up with the mission that we were doing of... Uh, uh, using uh, helping veterans along the way. So our organization has actually kind of come to the end of their useful life, as we all must. Uh, so uh, I would simply say that I greatly appreciated the opportunity I had to get together with those veterans over the years and the ways it's led me to be with other veterans like you over the, over the current years. And uh, as it did uh, getting me to meet with Martin and the others. Uh, it's just been a wonderful adventure. And if I had to shout out to anything, I'd uh, give a shout out to those uh, veterans who are still wondering if there is something more in life after they came back from uh, the war zone. And I would say to them, yes, there is a lot more to life than, uh, than the experience you had in the military. It may help define you. It may help teach you. But don't let it limit you. Don't let it limit you. There's something more. There's hope, there's healing, there's love, there's joy. And I will witness to it all. Just as this has been a joy to meet with you today, Chris. I was going to say on that note, what a perfect point to, um, to bring the podcast to a close. Alan, it's been absolutely wonderful. I hope you do visit Cornwall because Cornwall is literally about four miles over there for me. Really? Yeah. So I can treat you to a, a Cornish pasty. Okay. Um, I will pick you up on that. Yeah. Which uh, uh, you're absolutely going to love. It's the old, um, it's the traditional food for the tin miners. So <laughs> when they walked from Plymouth, which is where I am, up onto their mine workings, up on Dartmoor or, or down there in Cornwall, they'd, uh, they're wives would pack them off with a bag of these pasties which is a meat pie for anyone who's wondering yeah. what we're talking about and uh yes i look forward to to sharing one with you and when we do i will tell you a story about pasties brilliant i've got one <laughs> alan just stay on the line so i can thank you properly but um okay sending all of our love to our american brothers and sisters and, and yourself and all of our our veterans family. Thank you so much for, sh for sharing your story. Um, it's, uh, I would say it's been an eye opener, but it's been an ear opener if, if, that, if, if there is even such a thing. So, so thank you. And to our friends at home, massive love to you all as well. If you could like and subscribe to support the podcast, that would be wonderful. And we'll see you next time.